with those who are thinking critically about the built-in assumptions and proxies and implications. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet and name tags over here. Um, and I think that's about it. So, our first person is... So, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, so the way we're going to do this, oh. you all have a list and your table so you can follow along. So we'll ask each fellow to come up one after the other. So I hope you're going to be the first one. And the fellow will introduce themselves. And they're up here. So ask Emma to come up. Shudder. Yeah. Uh, shudder. Yeah. And then she'll say something very briefly about yourself. And you'll have a five minute lightning talk. Susanna, oh, hit the HDMI too. If you stand here and use the mic, do I need to turn on the mic or is it not? No, it's on. So, it's okay. just like, just speak normally. Part of my project that are some conclusions. 
really think the apps are very much personal. They are passion projects. Um, um, however, I do want to also say that um, I don't think all of the problems associated with code and coding practices related to diversity um, can just be fixed by saying something like, let's include more diverse populations of people who code, right? We can't just insert people into coding. Um, sorry, I lost my face a little bit. Um, but I do want to also mention that one thing that came up in all of my interviews was that the demographics of the users who use these apps are kept in mind by the people who create them, the people who market them, and it kind of creates this circulatory exclusionary effect where um, the target demographic becomes increasingly white, uh, female, cisgendered women, and that's problematic in its own ways, right? So again, it goes from being a passion project, you want to financially break even, and then you want to be stable. Um, more conclusions, this is more of sort of the cultural critique. Um, so when I say a neoliberal rationalization, um, I'm drawing upon the way that the word neoliberal is often used in cultural studies. Uh, historically, there were more support mechanisms available publicly, such as socialized or nationalized healthcare. Um, but in the United States, our cultural context is one where individuals are held responsible and accountable for their own health in increasingly technological ways. Um, so I position these apps um, alongside things like Fitbits or calorie counting. Um, so they become easier, or we could say more portable, but still another shift of work in our contemporary state. And as it relates to mental health care, um, we've all become, or are expected to be able to become, proficient in what Nicholas Rose calls the science of psychiatry, disciplines related to psychiatry, which exists in popular culture. Um, so just my final slide, I wanted to return to this question, where is the human in the data? Um, and I want to just highlight that there are other aspects of what com what constitutes human in the data, particularly when we think about technological in innovation. Um, so during the small group discussions, I am going to talk about how the human exists in the data regarding how developers conceive of people who use their, their products. And this is what I'm going to talk about problems re related to inclusiveness, like um, access and customization. So those are my not so happy findings. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is Lars. Through this research, I discovered instances where a person's 
uh, current legal name, so like after a name change, um, is illeg was illegible to the private sector precisely because their new name appeared fraudulent or would not connect with their previous name. This produced a range of consequences for people, um, from being out of a job application as trans to being denied a loan. So over the summer, I ran two focus groups consisting of trans people who were either in the process of changing their names legally or who had already completed uh, legal name changing the courts. And I'll spend the rest of this really short talk talking about these uh, focus groups. Um, so I asked participants to discuss what their name change was like, what obstacles they encountered, and where they could support, and about the aftermath of a name change. I specifically asked about um, how their name and sex marker changes were represented in the data. So where did they see their previous name continue to pop up? How did the name, uh, name change impact their job, housing, and healthcare situations? Did they have any issues on their credit reports? Um, and my, my participants spoke on a number of different themes. They repeatedly drew attention to the fact that identity is constructed through a number of different institutional forces and players, through clerks, judges, call center representatives, um, state bureaucrats, administrators, pieces of paper, bits of data, phone calls, complaints, and errors. One participant remarked that while she had no issue changing her name on her credit card, the proof, of the com the proof that that company required was easily, easily forgeable. Others remarked that they were able to open a credit card in non-legal names before they could change their names in court, pointing to the ways that credit card companies aggressively market and extend credit to anyone who is willing to pay a bill. Two participants remarked that they preemptively um, come out when they're applying for jobs in cover letters to avoid being accused of lying on their job applications when the company conducts a background check. Because a person's previous name remains on the credit report indefinitely after a name change, these participants felt pressure to disclose before their employer could use the exclusion of their former name against them. One participant who persistently discloses her trans status is currently unemployed and has been looking for a job for over a year. The afterlife of her identification data has tangible and material effects. Uh, participants also spoke about the ways their former name appears in places they are unable to change, shifting the focus from the digital to the analog. One noted, and this is her words, Actually, a lot of paper does still exist. That comes up to haunt you, because they can change an electronic record from that point forward. Everything follows, but you have a hundred pieces of paper scattered across various things. In many ways, we can think of the dispersed networks of digital data in this way, too. A hundred pieces of paper akin to the hundreds of databases that store outdated data. In summation, collecting, circulating, and storing identification data negatively impacts trans people who trans people whose names and sex markers change over time, and who are heavily scrutinized for the ways their identity data changes. Further, increased reliance on data for authentication and verification asks trans people to disclose their trans identities more often, pushing people into situations of greater precarity in the name of data-driven risk management. Thank you. Yet, 
the, uh, since the link between numbers and markets is rather weak, in the sense that the numbers do not present markets completely, this very obscure formation of markets that can never be fully captured turns markets into a, I'm quoting, a greater being, a being that is sometimes coherent, but other times dispersed and fragmented. Again, back to the original question. If, and I'm still quoting, flickering, flickering screen contents with the expression of a face, or rather with that of many faces, and each screen and subscreen has its own rhythm of change and needs to be decoded in a different way, unquote. Then, how do financial players apprehend the markets vis a vis the screens they use? These flickering screens with that of many faces is the subject matter of this project. Even the fact that every, let it be big or small, every transaction the traders make cumulatively create the big data of finance, we will be able to understand the market picture or the sense of the market the traders have as a way of conceiving the markets only by exploring how financial players recognize or organize the screen contents and engage with their screens. Therefore, just like every other person who has a face of her own, I will suggest that every trader has a market picture of her own. The market whose meaning can be uncovered if the unit of meaning is seen as a product of screens as collage works. To put it differently, I will show that the way in which traders organize their screens, the screen contents, enables the visualization of financial data, which is contingent upon the inter-institutional trust, and how the issue of trust is very influential in the process of data collection and engagement with the markets through trading. Lastly, I will discuss how the visualization and the implementation of data is enabled only if traders cannot insert themselves, in other words, can see their traces of trading on the screens into the market picture they, they construct. <coughs> in this regard, I will argue that screens can be seen as mirrors through which traders reflect themselves on the market, uh, onto the market picture they create.
By translating tabular data to a graphical form, Galton was able to more clearly see the relations of this data, and by extension, their significance. Data visualizations are often treated in general parlance as static representations of information or end products of an inquiry whose primary use is communicating results to an audience. As one historian of statistic, statistics put it, graphical representations are display tools and rhetorical devices. Yet as other scholars have it, graphic depiction of data can help us see things that otherwise would have been invisible, or to see what we were not expecting. Indeed, this is the case with Galton's scatter plot. It was not until after this visualization in 1886 and another version of the scatter plot with new data sets in 1890 that Galton understood correlation as a generalized statistical relationship that is not just something for human heredity. These visualizations gave rise to the concept, and only some years later, to Pearson's mathematical formula, otherwise known as the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. What I'm arguing is that the forms we ask our data to take matter. Form is a term likely more familiar, familiar to literary critics and humanities scholars generally, but Caroline Levine's recent definition of form as an arrangement of elements and ordering, patterning, or shaping has broader relevant, relevance for a range of disciplines, including statistics and mathematics. I'm arguing that form is not simply communicative, but exploratory. Like Galton's scatter plot helped reveal new relationships between data on intergenerational height, different forms can help us see and understand things in altogether different ways. New forms give us new eyes. In my 10 minute talk, I'll speak more about the way another late 19th century form brought to light new relationships between variables by pairing and smoothing data. The scatter plot, I'm arguing, finds an unexpected literary twin in the epigram, a rhetorical construction that pairs seemingly antithetical qualities to demonstrate underlying likeness. And I'll close by considering how an increased sensitivity to data's different forms. The Galtonian scatter plot and the Meredithian epigram in particular can help us better navigate the 21st century term to data storytelling. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure what Thank you. <laughs> okay, so hi, I'm Alex Fink. Um, I, I study youth participatory politics, youth development, and the impacts of big data surveillance in the school. I'm in the School of Social Work. And I'm going to present a little bit on that research today. Um, so social services in the United States have always been part of a social surveillance and control mechanism. They've helped governments and society sort out those who belong and those who need to be fixed or repaired in order to belong. In the past, data collection and social services was primarily for the purpose of knowing how many people were using services and to determine whether or not a person was eligible to continue to receive services. This data was collected and kept within a single organization, and it was slow to collect, slow to examine, and very slow to be shared. However, because of a new demand for data to measure academic progress, and now because of correlations that have been drawn between academic progress and broader child development goals, there's an increasing demand to collect and share data between service providers. So new strategies in social service administration, such as collective impact, and in education specifically, an initiative that was created by the federal government called Promise Neighborhoods. Um, groups are now investing heavily in data collection and sharing platforms. These platforms are collecting and sharing data, usually instantly now, about individual young people and their families across dozens of service providers with the goal of intervening in any possible way to ensure progress against a series of metrics some academic, and others related to child development more broadly. So from a social service point of view, these systems appear to be more efficient at moving the needle on major social issues, like graduating children from high school and closing the so-called achievement gap. However, these systems, with greater efficiency and efficacy than ever, 
also apply a very particular model of child development on every young person in their reach. My research is concerned with the degree to which these models of child development have been modeled on psychological research done primarily on white, middle-class male kids in the United States and are being applied to families of color around the country. I believe we need to ask in what ways these projects are tracking kids so they can live better lives, and in what ways they're tracking them to better fit them in white, settler, colonial, neoliberal America. And further, is this really what families and their children want? So my, proje my project seeks to understand the ways that the now constant and thorough surveillance of the lives of young people living in promised neighborhoods affects and is changed by their sense of agency, identities, and imagined futures. There's a few significant learnings so far that I'd like to share with you from my project about the ways that promised neighborhoods are structured that impact young people's lives with little input from the young people involved. It isn't clear that young people are offered many choices within these programs about their own goals and desires, especially when they don't conform to the ideas that these programs have for them. Promised neighborhoods have specific outcome measures, often related to categories like health, family, education, and community. And these things taken individually in each area are very useful and meaningful, often fundamental to a young person's well-being. But when all the efforts are made to push young people and their families through a series of hoops to achieve certain outcome metrics, we start to walk a very thin line between supporting and manipulating the young people that are involved. The data that's collected and shared about young people and their families in many of these programs is not only used to shape and measure the direction and success of the organization, but also significant individual data is aggravated and aggregated and shared between service organizations, meaning that service providers now have significant context about individual youth, which of course is offered through a very specific lens of the data that we've chosen to collect. Further, an essential part of the Promise Neighborhood strategy is to have community workers who utilize this data to ensure various incentives and encouragement leads to specific interventions that are applied to individuals and their families, including showing up at their doorstep to make sure that they comply. My research has shown that the board of directors and governance in most of these organizations don't have any community representation, have little involvement from parents, and almost no involvement whatsoever from the young people. Given these programs have such a direct impact on these individuals' lives, it's interesting there's so few involved in governance. So it isn't clear that parents or young people have any role in determining what is best for them. It is clear that significant amounts of money are coming from corporate America to support these programs, and that significant amounts of money are going back to corporate America in the form of special charter schools, private administrative support services, data management systems, and of course future labor. While constituent programs within promised neighborhoods often draw from a variety of local, state, and federal public funding sources, the coordinating entities themselves receive significant private dollars, and thus we must consider to some extent the source of their priorities. This research shouldn't lead us to make brash judgments about promised neighborhoods, but the purpose is to spend time thinking about the implications of these kinds of data collection and use, and the political and economic interests involved in shaping them. It is my contention that these agencies, intentionally or no, are an example of a broader trend in social service administration to use very specific types of data to shape an increasingly narrow field of choice and possibility for young people. I will share further detail details of this research and what it reveals as possibilities for developing richly supportive environments for young people while also broadening rather than narrowing their fields of self-imagination and possibility. Thank you. data collection have become ubiquitous in a variety of service occupations. In few industries is this more apparent than the booming fast fashion mode. Worldwide fast fashion brands such as Zara, H&M, and Forever 21 have pioneered commodity production and logistics management by producing, circulating, and selling trendy, cheap clothing at breakneck speed, bringing new stock onto their sales floor each day. Increasingly key to this industry is analytics software which allows companies to aggregate and synthesize large amounts of data 
in order to optimize their labor. For this workshop, I present findings from my ethnographic study, one of the first in the fast fashion industry, with insights into how frontline employees engage in the work of being watched, abstracted, and analyzed by management software, as well as how the software is framed and um, implemented by human resource professionals. So as fast fashion garment prices hit bottom limits, customers can now easily purchase blouses for just a few dollars. Slashing frontline labor costs has be become a primary method of boosting corporate profits. And in this context, software programs have emerged to help companies eliminate overstaffing, boost productivity, and more precisely meet store demands by mining a number of metrics, including but not limited to cashier speed, current customer traffic, annual sales figures, and even the weather, allowing employers to distinguish between labor time that generates profit and labor time down to the minute that does not. So you can see on this slide, um, in the green, they're looking at labor hours, and in, in the red, they're looking at the cost of those labor hours, and they're trying to eliminate that cost. Previous research has shown that with this new software, retailers have transitioned from a stable, full-time workforce to one that is primarily part-time and even on-call, often to the detriment of employees' health and well-being. However, there has thus far been little scholarly examination of what else might be missing in all these data. That is, beyond simply collecting metrics about what it's like to work in these places, how are these systems actively shaping how employees relate to the workplace? In exploring this question, I attempt to advance social the theory on how data both objectifies and subjectifies humans at work. Since summer 2015, I have conducted IRB-approved covert workplace ethnography at two of the nation's largest fast fashion stores in New York City. In my field notes, I document my experiences as an embodied entry-level worker, scanning my fingerprint to clock in on machines like this one, spotting myself projected on closed-circuit television as I dash across the store, becoming anxious about quickly and accurately bringing up customers amid countless distractions, and simply trying to survive on menial wages in a constantly shifting schedule. Following critical surveillance scholars, I pay attention not only to how these systems work, but also when and how they fail. So locating attempts to uh, quickly quantify, sort, and abstract workers engenders moments of struggle not easily captured in the data. As I discovered, these supposedly more reliable methods of, say, timekeeping regularly uh, malfunction, presenting possibilities for wage theft on the one hand if managers incorrectly document employee hours, but also, as I found, opportunities to pad their schedules, perhaps glossing over the fact that they returned late from their short lunch break. And even while properly functioning, it's not uncommon for employees to clock in well before their shift actually starts, trying to steal back lost wages, while others post on social media from their cell phones, while in the bathrooms or dressing rooms, using technology meant to track them as a means of refusing complete control. And finally, in contrast to these bottom-up sales floor experiences, I spent a significant amount of time researching how this data is produced and sold from the top down by industry insider themselves. Earlier this summer, I attended a national retail conference um, in combination with corporate websites and other information, informational material. I've gotten a sense of how the industry creates this discourse which obsesses over this threat of the disgruntled or inefficient worker. Um, revealing significant overlap and even collusion with the modern police state. And here you'll see what was a fusion center at this conference in which retailers were able to build relationships with local police departments. If you join me for my 10 minute presentation and discussion, I'll go into each of these topics, worker experiences and corporate framing of emerging management software in more detail. Taken together, I hope this conversation will begin to illuminate how taking fast fashion more seriously can generate significant insight into how data fashion us. Thanks. Okay, we're moving on to our fourth topic, civic technology participation in interrogating data. Um, I'm Amelia Hassoun, I'm a second year uh, PhD student in anthropology, 
And um, my research focuses on the social life of design very broadly. Um, so what that means for me methodologically is doing an object biography of data. So that means following data through an entire system to understand its articulations and interactions with people and also other objects. And I'm interested in how this um, process sheds light on system design as a whole. So this was a method that I used in my master's thesis to look at with our medical data in um, the England's National Health Service, um, particularly open source software. Um, so what this allows us to do, doing this kind of object biography, is uh, oh, sorry about the monkey one, um, is, <laughs> is ask questions along the entire pathway. So questions like who is gathering data and designing the study, and about whom is this data being gathered? Um, how is that data being represented to be inputted? What work is being done to process and aggregate that data, and who makes these systems and algorithms? And what is the output for? And who is analyzing it? And for what and how and by whom? Um, and so for me, this systematically allows me to look at where the human is in the data at all of these levels of inquiry. Um, but also, my argument is that um, there's a lot of imaginative work that goes into producing and transmitting data um, about both the people um, that the data is gathered about, but also the features that such data might be able to bring into being. Um, so I'm particularly interested in these questions in terms of, uh, in the context of participatory design. So um, I'm going to be going into this a lot more at the table, but what happens when you let the people that you're studying continuously shape your study design? And what happens when you bring that data you gather back to people and talk to them about it? Um, so much more specifically, um, my work looks at the smart nation in Singapore. So Singapore has been undertaking this project to create a smart nation, which in their word, in the words of the government is to um, empower people through data. But what this is actually materially look like is embedding a lot of sensors in the urban fabric that gather information about, gather data about citizens in, in taxis and in um, just the general city and in homes. Um, and so um, I argue that the kind of data and uses um, that this uh, that these technologies, um, that the data gathering technologies, uh, sorry, um, that, that the kind of data and the uses that it's put to um, articulate imagined futures that, um, for both Singapore and for Singapore's place in the, in the general world. Um, so this summer particularly, I work with people trying to make smart homes. Well, thanks to this wonderful fellowship, I was able to do pilot research. Um, and I looked at people who were trying to make smart homes, particularly for elderly people. Um, and so I was able to talk to government organizations, like officials and government organizations who were working to sort of develop the smart nation, as well as designers and developers trying to develop these smart homes. Um, and so um, in these smart houses, um, the idea is to embed sensors. So like how many times you open the fridge, how many times you walk through the door, motion sensors and detectors. So I was able, and I'll talk about this again a lot more at the table, um, to go look at the prototyping of the technology and how that data was being gathered and then how that was implanted in the house and then also consultation sessions between um, the developers and people using the home. There are some good stories uh, about that. Um, and so this kind of seems like small data. So one of the questions that I'm also interested in is how does small data become big data, right? So if you look at this, um, it's one, one or two or a housing block full of these homes with sensors embedded that are gathering data on people. The idea behind this is actually to have these technologies in most homes in Singapore. So I'm interested in how that data sort of scales up and becomes big, right? Um, and all of the steps along the way that that requires. Um, and so, Singapore's right there. <laughs> um, right, so my main research questions are what data gathering process is, participatory or recursive, otherwise existence of my nation building in Singapore, and how these processes materially affect residents' daily lives. So I just want to end on the note, um, I was talking to one of the women who works in one of the government organizations, it's called the Urban Redevelopment Authority, um, and she was talking about how there are useful kinds of data and not useful kinds of data. Um, and so one of, the big, um, one of the big projects that the government is sort of undertaking right now is um, looking at MRT taps, so that's the subway. So and this is what she terms passive data. So data that people don't actually know is being gathered. So you walk in, tap it on the subway, you go through, that generates a lot of information. She says on the other end of the spectrum, you have data that people are actively self-tracking. So you have a cell phone app, for example, you ask people to input. But the sensor data, which is what most of the 
data is has ended up being so far is sort of in this middle ground of like people are aware it's there, it's happening, especially in the home, which is a very intimate space, but they're not sort of like actively producing this in the sense of inputting it. So I want to just draw attention to the fact that um, data differs, right? There's a lot of different kinds, and, and that's materially important. Um, so that is where I want to. Computational functionalism provides the basis for the project of engineering human level artificial intelligence, which is the attempt to realize through computational machines uh, some of the cognitive abilities that are usually taken to be unique to the human animal. The less parochial name for this is artificial general intelligence, or AGI. Although the generality of intelligence is ambiguous by definition, researchers in the field of intelligence uh, researchers in the field define the intelligence of a machine in terms of its ability to solve problems process data about its environment, for example, the current state of the chess game, in order to determine how best to act to achieve its goal. What moves are available? What consequences could they have? And which move should a machine make if it wants to win the game? A machine that systematically simulates and, in and integrates both what it can do and what it should do generates a functional model of itself as a goal-oriented agent but the brute simulation of all possible games can result in combinatorial explosion. While looking only a few moves ahead, leaves an agent open to making mistakes or falling for traps. For a machine to negotiate these constraints efficiently and effectively, it needs to develop domain-specific knowledge that can bring the game tree into something more tractable. Thus, the ability of a constrained agent to learn tendencies and device heuristics is indispensable for navigating complex environments. This generalizable knowledge that the machine produces about the game, the knowledge that actually establishes the domain by extending the dynamic norms of meaning and behavior across different game states, transforms the implementation of algorithms into the actual activity of playing the game. That is, it transforms the procedural structure of a board into the interactive structure of the game through the simulation of other players. In other words, what is at stake in playing the game is a disjunctive synthesis that manifests the patterns of other ways to play and in fact, other games. If what is human about general intelligence is that the social activity of thinking has a way of changing the rules, then the engineering of artificial general intelligence compels a project such as our search for the human in the data to ask whether or not there is any such thing to find. What if, irreducible to any sort of thing that might be supposed conspicuously absent, the human designates instead its own trajectory away from itself? as through the realization of the human in still other sorts of machines, and still other ways to play the game. What if finding the human in the data, like Turing's imitation game, means nothing more that we won't know it when we see it? And that consequently, when we look in the mirror, we find that we no longer recognize ourselves. Everybody, please, want some philosophy? 
Um, so the short aim of my talk is the real human is not in the data, at least not, <laughs> at least not yet. Um, so my point is brief and direct. Uh, big data should not be considered a source of scientific knowledge about human cognition, human emotion, or human nature. Cluster of things. Uh, at best, big data can provide knowledge of human behavior, but however, as demonstrated by the historical failure of behaviorism within psychology, analysis of behavior does not reveal the nature of the mental processes behind the behavior. Big data is a product of human behavior. Often this data generating behavior is humans interacting with computers. I mean, there are exceptions, like we saw with sensors and with our, the location data that our phones are spilling out to Google as we move around the uh, Earth. Um, but what I <coughs> want to focus on is that a lot of the big data that we analyze is humans interacting with computers to produce this data. Um, this isn't just a fact about big data, but it's a real problem for little data. Uh, for example, the use of computers to run experiments in psychology laboratories has proven to introduce complexities and confounding variables that some have suspected could be partly causing the replication crisis in psychology research. So lots of research projects are done at computers. The fact that the person is at the computer already drastically influences the data that they produce. Um, and this might seem like a trivial point, arguing that this is a really important point about the data that we analyze, is that it is actually produced at a computer. There's a whole set of expectations that people bring when they use computers. And um, so uh, the data can be influenced by the many ways in which computer software and hardware can vary. Um, the screen resolution, the brightness, the refresh rate, the quality and design of the keyboard and mouse and headphones, the performance of the CPU, RAM, and circuit boards, the strength of network connection, and so on. Any of these things can skew the data created by a human using computer. And this has shown up in a lot of psychology studies. These types of things, if they, well, it's very difficult to keep them constant, but they do affect the way that uh, the data is produced at the computer. So, uh, furthermore, software user interfaces notoriously influence user performance, decisions, data creation as countless software usability studies have shown. that involve a lot of usability research, user interface design, and tiny tweaks to user interface can drastically influence the way that people interact with that application. Um, so the, from form to function to aesthetic, the user, user interface can alter and influence how a user will interact with the application, including the data they create with their interactions. Experiments have shown that the design aesthetic can drive certain emotions in users, and these emotions can influence the data Generated. Design aesthetic can make people feel all variety of different ways about how they're interacting with this application. Uh, but computer use brings more problems than just hardware and software variables. Humans activate a full set of expectations based on past experience with computers every time they create data on a computer. Uh, research has shown that users vary in terms of how much they trust or mistrust computers. Some people uh, consider computers to be like a more valid source of information more trusted. Others highly mistrust computers and think that anything that they put into a computer is they need to be careful, and anything they get back from a computer they need to be careful. So there's a wide variety there and those sets get activated uh, when people are simply interacting with the computer to generate data. Um, so we have a whole set of assumptions there uh, that, that are implicit. Uh, just toward the general idea of just using a computer. As mentioned, all this challenges efforts to make scientific conclusions about human phenomena, and these challenges exist for little data as well as for big data. But with big data, the problems are bigger. Uh, this is especially true when the data has been generated by publicly available online web applications like Twitter, Flickr, Facebook, uh, something I would call found data. Uh, some cognitive scientists are becoming very excited at the prospect of analyzing these found data sets to reach conclusions about the workings of human cognition. While I do share their excitement, I realize that the data is being generated by people using computers in a huge variety of highly variable contexts, different hardware and software configurations, different system environments, like how many blinking chat windows were open when somebody was writing their Facebook post. Uh, different physical environments, like were there kids screaming or a TV blaring or a bartender bringing more drinks. 
you don't know any of that when you're analyzing this found data. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, people differ in their motivations for using such web applications. Some people only make posts when they feel sad or happy. And so when you're analyzing this data to get ideas of human emotions, well, it's already, people have already only made the data because they felt a certain emotion. So that skews it in that way. Um, and in general, just their affect toward web applications, toward social networks, toward the internet in general, and computers in general. Um, finally, researchers likely cannot determine the state of the user's news feed when they made the data. Um, you can analyze a lot of posts, but you can't always know exactly which posts were like, that they just read before they made that data. You don't know which profile pictures were shown. And pictures, of course, influence emotions greatly. And so the profile pictures of their friends and of the different things on the page as they create their data can drastically influence uh, the creation of that uh, and what they create. Um, <clears throat> so finally, many large web applications display advertisements that are specifically designed to manipulate attention and emotion. And these advertisements are right there next to the input forms when people are inputting this data. Um, so when analyzing large data sets, especially this social network data to make conclusions about human emotion, human cognition, and how things work. Conclusions that are beyond just behavioral conclusions. Um, I think that we need uh, to really face these challenges. Um, in the table discussion, I'll talk more about my thoughts about 